Till may not sound familiar, but what happened to him in 1955 stunned the nation. Emmett Till was a young black boy who was murdered in Mississippi for whistling at a white woman, and his death was a spark that ignited the civil rights movement in America. Two white men were put on trial for killing him, but in spite of strong evidence against them, they were acquitted in about an hour by an all-white jury. I, I, I looked, I saw two men standing over the bed with the one had a gun, which was J.W. Myler. I saw uh, Roy Bryant. They ordered me to lay back down and go back to sleep. And they ordered Emmett to get up and put his clothes on. And my mother was pleading and begging with him not to take him. My dad was pleading with him. And, and my mother then at that time offered to, uh, to give them money to leave uh, Emmett alone, and Roy Bryant kind of hesitated, but J.W. Milan, he, he didn't hesitate at all. He didn't even think about taking money. He came there to take Emmett, and that's what he proceeded to do. Roy Bryant, J.W. Milan, two other white men, and two black men who worked for Milan. Soon after, Reed said he saw the same truck parked in front of a barn managed at the time by Milan's brother and heard the screams of a young boy he presumed was Emmett Till. Today at age 67, Reed says he still cannot get those sounds out of his mind. I heard the streaming, beating, streaming, and beating. And I said to myself, I said, you know, I said, man, I'm beating somebody in that barn. I can hear the beating. I, can, I mean, it looks like I hear the licks. You, you could hear the licks? Yes, you could. You could. I looked at the bridge of his nose and it looked like someone had taken a meat chopper and chopped it. And I looked at his teeth because I took so much pride in his teeth. His teeth were the prettiest things I'd ever seen in my life, I thought. And uh, I only saw two. Who were the rest of them? They had just been knocked out. And I was looking at his ears, and that's when I discovered a hole about here, and I could see daylight on the other side. I said, now, was it necessary to shoot him? Some 50,000 people, nearly all of them black, turned out for Emmett Till's funeral in an enormous public display of grief and solidarity. He has been brutally brutally beaten. As the trial drew to a close, attorneys for J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant warned the all-white jury that if they voted to convict, quote, your forefathers will turn over in their graves. It took the jury just an hour and seven minutes to return a verdict of not guilty. One juror said it wouldn't have taken that long, but they stopped to take a soda pop break to make it look good. Milam and Bryant were congratulated by their many supporters and kissed their wives in celebration. How do you folks feel now that it's all over? Roy, how about you? I'm just glad it's over with. Four months after the trial, knowing that double jeopardy protected them from being tried again, Roy Bryan and J.W. Milam admitted to a reporter from Look Magazine that they had, in fact, tortured and murdered Emmett Till. They were paid $4,000 for their story. In it, Milam said, I just made up my mind. Chicago boy, I said, I'm tired of them sending your kind down here to stir up trouble. Damn you, I'm going to make an example of you. Parker was there outside the Mississippi grocery store when his cousin, Emmett Till, whistled at this white woman, Carolyn Bryant. She claimed Till physically and verbally accosted her. Days later, her husband and brother-in-law kidnapped, beat, and shot Till. Now, a bombshell in this book set to hit shelves next week. Bryant takes back her story that led to Till's lynching. She was just trying to say that nothing that went on between them constituted any excuse for anyone harming him. Bryant, captured here by 60 Minutes in 2004, now admits it was all a lie.
unserved arrest warrant was found in the killing of Emmett Till in 1955. It was in the uh, basement of a missing... The family of Emmett Till is demanding an arrest after an unserved warrant is found 66 years later. That warrant... Yeah, those activists showed up at two addresses where they believe we Carolyn... Do everything we can to push for the conviction of Carolyn Bryant Zombie. And let's get justice for Emmett Till once and for all. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we, first of all, you know, I know that uh, following the ending of this program, we're going to have people asking us, did you have to be so vivid with the, the video, with the shot and the screaming and this and that? And so I want to address it now um, by saying yes. Um, I think it's absolutely important that we look at the reality of what has taken place um, to this young boy, uh, what has taken, what has this event done? And we have to look at it realistically. Um, we've noticed that over a period of time, as time goes by, people detach themselves from the emotional nearness that one should feel to the situation and begin to just write it off as just another sad story. Um, and it is more than just another sad story. It is our story that we have experienced at that time and that we are still experiencing to this day. Everything that we come in contact with on a daily basis are all products of racism, white supremacy on all levels of oppression and degradation to the Nubian race. I don't know about you all, but I feel every day I wake up, there's a gun pointed to my head. And not just me, but our children. Emmett Till was 14 years old. I have a son that is 10 years old. There is nothing preventing my son or your son from being targeted. In fact, we are born targets as long as we are a threat to white genetic survival. So today we have with us two very, 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 very special guests. Um, we have attorney Jeribu Hill. Um, she is actively involved in this case right now. And we also have Alma Stockstill, who is the LeFleur County Clerk. Um, and they both play a major, a major role in this conversation that we're going to have today. So I just want to first give a briefing about our guests before they actually speak. Um, Jeribu Hill is a civil and human rights attorney. She is a founder and executive director of the Mississippi Workers Center for Human Rights. Um, Hill is an author and an international spokesperson on civil and human rights topics in support of the human rights struggles of workers across the globe. Jeribu has traveled to Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Caribbean. Through her organization, Attorney Hill has provided legal representation and advocacy for hundreds of workers in the state. Her efforts have led, have led to the adoption of the zero tolerance against hate policies being implemented and workspaces across the state. Hill also won an important judgment against the Ku Klux Klan um, in South Carolina and has assisted Mississippi Delta parents in their fight for school equality. Hill is the recipient of the Gloria Award, um, named for Gloria Stenham. Um, also, Attorney Hill is admitted to the U.S. Supreme Court and serves as a special master in Washington County Chancery Court and is a former municipal judge in the city of Hollandale. So we wanna welcome you onto the show today, um, as well as our second guest, which is Elmas Stocksill. He is a graduate of the Mississippi Valley State University and received his master's, his master's of science degree in criminal justice from MVSU. Mr. Stock still worked 14 years for the House of Representatives under the leadership of Congressman Benny G. Thompson, six years as alderman at large and vice mayor for the city of Etobena, and seven years as adjunct professor for the Department of Criminal Justice at MVSU. He is also certified in community organizing 
from Naval Works Institute of Washington, D.C. Currently, Mr. Stockstill is serving his third term as LeFleur County Clerk, um, and Mr. Stockstill is also a co-founder and president of Etabena Recreational League. And his motto is lifting as we climb. So I want to start off by um, asking you, um, Jaribo, a question, if you don't mind answering. And it's a two-part question. Um, you know, you are so amazing. You're doing so many amazing things, um, fighting for justice and just overall natural human rights for Black people. And so can you explain, just give us a briefing of all the things that you're actively involved in now? as well as um, I've heard you say that you don't feel the Mississippi Delta gets the attention that it requires, that it's been overlooked and that um, it's been left behind. So, you know, some people may say, well, you're award-winning, you're, 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 you're definitely successful and you're a representation for the Mississippi Delta. So how do you feel through all the things you are actively involved in, all your achievements that you all are left behind? Thank you so much, Azandi, for having me. And I'd like to thank the Right Righteous Jewels platform and also Kiana for having me today on the program and to be sitting here on screen with my good friend and brother, Elma Stockstill, who is an amazing young man, a courageous leader, where many elected officials are pleaders and not leaders. So I have to say that because when I come across the real deal, I have to lift that up. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, yes, you are correct. I've made the statement many times about uh, what I see as a double standard in terms of resource uh, disbursement and distribution, in terms of highlighting the historic struggles of our people. This is where many, many a civil rights battle, a human rights battle occurred in the Mississippi Delta. And I am not born of the Mississippi Delta, but I'm a product of the Mississippi Delta in that both of my, both sets of my grandparents, maternal and paternal grandparents are from Bolivar County, Mississippi, as is my father and all of his family. My mother and her siblings were actually uh, born in Memphis because their Shaw, Mississippi parents went to the big city for reasons unknown and that's where they raised their family. But, but for that, they would have been born in Mississippi too. My mother, my mother and her brothers would have been born in Mississippi as well. So I feel a very close kin, kinship to Mississippi. I feel that um, I am the product of the Mississippi Delta and I have to lift it up because I do see many times over when you discuss Mississippi, when you hear people saying I'm traveling to Mississippi or I'm gonna do work in Mississippi, most often they refer to Jackson. And yes, Jackson is the capital. There's a lot of amazing work going on there. Shout out to Mayor Antar Lumumba and his team and others who are doing really good work, both in terms of the nonprofit work that's going on there and otherwise. But we also have to continuously remind people that we're not just one county. We're not just in Hines County. We're in 23 counties over this way. And uh, Congressman Thompson represents all of those counties, the second congressional district. So we want to make sure that attention is paid, that the light is, shone, is, is shined on the work that's been done here before me and after me. And see, sometimes people say, oh, but yeah, there's a Mississippi Workers' Center, but there's a lot of work went on before the formation of the Mississippi Workers' Center, which is a 25-year-old organization. But before mm -hmm. that work, there were so many folks that came this way and did this amazing work. I, I could start with SNCC, but I wouldn't end with SNCC. Uh, the Black Power Movement produced some powerful leaders as well. So we have a history of resistance here. We have a history of fighting back. We have a history of making demands. But sometimes mm -hmm. in, in the funding world and other worlds, our work is not lifted up. Our contributions to the civil rights movement in terms of the Delta and all, and Fannie Lou Hamer hails from, of course she hails originally from Montgomery County, but we own her. We claim her in the Delta because that's where she did most of her work. And she came here as a young child to Sunflower County 
And of course, the rest is history. What she did for us and, and the voting, the voting that we do now, even when we're disenchanted with the people that we have to vote for, we wouldn't be voting at all if it weren't for Fannie Lou Hamer, Victoria Gray, and Annie Devine. Those three stalwart mm -hmm. women were the ones who were the architects of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was born in the Delta. So mm -hmm. my work today is around workers' rights, specifically and housing rights. We take on violating employers who allow race discrimination to be the culture of the workplace. We take on slumlords, I guess better known as landlords, but they are slumlords, who promote mm -hmm. slums as housing and force people to pay rent for it. So we have been known to bring suits. Uh, we brought a suit against the largest employer in the state for allowing nooses to be made in the workplace and two of the people that we represented were victims of attempted lynchings. Mm. So we, and that was 21st century, 2000, wow. when the case first started with an EEOC claim and then uh, the lawsuit was filed in 2001. So we've seen all kinds of abuse of black workers in particular, low wage black workers in particular, who languish in poverty because there is no such thing as equality there's no such thing as justice. So that's mm -hmm. our work. And right now we're rep representing a woman who uh, was fired after uh, being diagnosed with COVID. Two days after her husband died from COVID, she was fired. And so we mm -hmm. are representing her in federal court as we speak. Wow. So the type okay. of issues that we take up on behalf of the people that we consider to be still dispossessed and disinherited. We take up causes for Black people, Black workers, and their families, and children who go to Jim Crow schools in the 21st century, and mm -hmm. folks who live in Jim Crow housing in the 21st century. So those mm -hmm. are the issues that we are about. We're currently of counsel to certain Till family members in this cause that you have so brilliantly highlighted today. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for having me. Definitely. Thank you for coming on. That is amazing. And we actually, you know, we always do our research on, you know, the, the doctors and, you know, the specialists and the, you know, business owners of the nonprofit organizations before you guys come on. And we definitely saw your website and it is truly commendable what you're doing. So we do appreciate that, you know, for our people as a whole, it's needed for sure. So Thank you. Oh, thank you. No problem. And Elmas, you as well, you know, you do have a nonprofit organization by the name of Ada Bena Recreational League, where you are, you know, mentoring the youth and which is so important. Our youth is very important because they're the next ones that's going to lead. So it's important to have the right type of influences and mentorship in the communities to really help these children along the way and find their path in the world. So Elmas, can you please give us an insight of exactly what you do at the Edabena, you know, um, nonprofit organization and how you help these children? Yes, ma'am. First of all, thank you all for allowing us the opportunity to come with you today to speak on behalf of Edabena Recreation League, the Florida County Second Clerk's Office and others. Um, the Ill Bene Recreation League started off, started off about probably about 13, 14 years ago. And it happened after the Bush administration uh, cut out funding for the National Youth Sports Program, which was formerly known as NYSP. Yeah. That was a program that reached out to the poor and uh, oftentimes neglected kids of the Mississippi Delta uh, in the Floor County, Cara County, Sunflower Counties and others. And during the summer uh, months, they would go to the NYSP and learn how to swim, uh, learn how to play basketball, football, meet with Mississippi Valley State University athletes, uh, some of the famous athletes like uh, Jerry Wright, uh, Willie Titan, uh, Carl Byron, Carl mm -hmm. Cole, those type of individuals that was professional football players as well as college students there on campus at that particular time. So mm -hmm. we would build relationships with those individuals as kids. And when uh, all of a sudden, when that administration got in office and they cut the funding, the NYSP was no more. So the kids mm -hmm. didn't have any events for the summer, the uh, mentoring, the enrichment programs, things of that nature. So uh, I, myself, along with several other deacons in the community, we met up on several occasions to start a nonprofit 
to address those needs of that void. And eventually uh, we met up and uh, decided to name this organization, Ilta Bena Recreation League, because we wanted to serve the kids of Ilta Bena, but also surrounding areas. Uh, we have areas like Morgan City, uh, the small area called Quito, the backside of Sidon, Swift Town. All these particular areas are rural to our community, not outside the community. So um, we address their needs. They come to uh, to the uh, community. We compete um, during the springtime for baseball. We got uh, T-ball, coach pitch, uh, 9, 10, fast pitch, and then 12, you fast pitch. Mm -hmm. It's communities throughout the Delta. And also with football, we compete against uh, individuals for several Delta towns here in the, the Mississippi Delta. And also outside the Delta Coast, sometimes we go up to uh, Coldwater, Mississippi, and uh, mm -hmm. there, down I 55. So um, we address so many kids. We have about 75 kids in our program. And during the summer, mm -hmm. we also have enrichment programs. We bring in uh, speakers. Uh, my former high school coach, Coach Marcella Singleton, he would come mm -hmm. in and provide some uh, leadership and talk about days I used to play football and uh, they motivate the kids. But at the end of the day, um, believe it or not, some of those kids don't have fathers. And we serve in that capacity. You know, we teach them right or wrong way of doing things. We teach them to stay, stand up right, to th do things the correct way. And they have made a tremendous difference in these kids' lives. Uh, last year, our local high school went to the championship round of the 2A state playoffs. And majority of the kids that was on that team either played under me for football or basketball. We went in football. So uh, hats off to those former coaches. Uh, Lee Day, he's one of the co-founders. I mean, he was one of the guys that go out there and just give his last dog to make sure those kids had uh, Gatorade, things of that nature, make sure they had the proper equipment and things that. Thank God for the Florida County Board of Supervisors. They also contribute a lot to our uh, nonprofit to make sure the kids have equipment. Uh, mm -hmm. Coach Harvey Waddell, who is, uh, was one of the swim teachers at NYSP, now he's out there volunteering with us with football and with baseball. And I played baseball on the Coach Waddell. So that show you how the cycle is, and you just mm -hmm. got to be places. And mm -hmm. like I said, thank you all so much for allowing me to even say uh, and, and tell you about our program. And we are looking for trying to get a 15-passenger uh, van so we continue to uh, go out to uh, pick kids up from the surrounding areas and also be able to travel uh, without having to do a lot of carpool because that's how mm -hmm. we do it. Uh, so anyway, you know, thank you again for allowing us the opportunity. Yes, most definitely. Um, and, you know, you just for yourself, um, looking at your story, we see how, you know, you had to run three times to even uh, attain the position that you now sit in. So can you give us a little bit about your experience um, running and when you finally were appointed that position, what some of the things you were faced with? Because we will get into Emmett Till very shortly, but I think it's very important to kind of look at the conditions um, each of us have faced along the way and, and, you know, in our journey so that we can see it's not just about Emmett Till. It's a conditioning for all of us that we are facing and, and we need to figure something out. So can you please give us your experience? Okay. Well, I would try to cut a long short story short because, <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. uh, when you say I ran three times, that is absolutely correct. And I could take you back when I first started running in 2004. And some of the things that I had to endure as a candidate uh, running against the powers to be here in the floor county. And you think about the history of the floor county, uh, some of your major civil rights events started right here in the floor county. And one of them all, will, is the Emmett Till kidnapping, which started in Money, Mississippi, which is located here in the floor county. And then you had the shooter of Mega Evans originated here from the floor county greenwood mississippi so you got a lot of rich history here uh but you got some good people here as well so when i first ran 
I ran ran to a lot of obstacles. Newspaper was against me at the time. I mean, I just couldn't get a break. I mean, they were bringing up the past. Uh, they make a good story out of bad story to make me look bad in the newspaper. So I lost that first year. Uh, at that time, I, I was working for Congressman Benny Thompson, and he kept giving me encouragement, like Elms, you know, you can't give up, you got to keep going. And so my second time I ran, my numbers got better. But uh, this time when I ran, I was coming back from uh, Greenville, Mississippi. And uh, as I was approaching the town, one of my fraternity brothers um, gave me a call. And he said, well, guess what, bro? I said, what? He said, well, they have signs throughout the community saying, save us from Elvis. And they had plastered the signs all over Greenwood, all over Ildabino. And uh, I was like, what you mean, man? He said, they literally got signs here that say, save us from Elvis. The person mm -hmm. that was offered proud to me was threatened by me because he felt like I was getting close. Mm -hmm. And he figured that he had to do something at the last minute to sort of sway the vote the other mm -hmm. way. And it worked, believe it or not. And uh, I came close, but I didn't get it. So I ran again uh, in 2011. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the help of good people, uh, first I had to, you know, give a shout out to Congressman Benny Thompson, who allowed me an opportunity while I was there to uh, to run for office. I sent to David Jordan, uh, who is a big civil rights leader here in the community. Uh, and he was very instrumental because he was taking some of his campaign money and actually helping me capitalize mm -hmm. that money to go out in the communities and everything. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you just have a lot of other people. Uh, one of my best friends, my first cousin, Sheila Stocksteel, Sheila Stocksteel Holston, who always kept me together because, you know, I was freaking out a lot of times when it came to <laughs> certain things that was going on. And I wanted to just ball my fists up and go to work, but sometimes things are done for a reason and she had to settle me down with that. Uh, and thank God, 2011, when my final numbers came in, I won by like over 1,200 votes of better. Okay, and yes, yes. Yeah. And during that race, during the primary, I had to run against four people. <laughs> I ended up in a runoff. I won the runoff. And waiting for me in the uh, general election was four other independents. Mm. So I had to endure that. So when I got in office, you know, I was sworn in. I was happy. Uh, you know, my mom got a chance to see me get sworn in as the first African-American circuit clerk. And I was just ecstatic. Mm -hmm. And uh, But little did I know, the worst was yet to come before the best got better. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's a better word. Okay. And I uh, got in office, uh, came here the first day. Uh, I couldn't even find an ink pen. <laughs> paper. Mm. I mean, the former clerk had cleaned out the office. Everything was gone. Mm. I, I couldn't. So the first thing I looked at was, wow, they had a jury to come in that same day. Uh, so I'm trying to write jury excuses. Didn't have a pen to write them with. Didn't have a typewriter to type them on. Wow. The jury wouldn't come up. I mean, it just was chaos that first first week. Then afterwards, I started to hire up my staff and everything. They came in with me, and we began to work. And then shortly after that, uh, I had to go before the Board of Supervisors probably about nine times to try to get a clerk, one of my deputy clerks hired up on my staff. Mm -hmm. and just bear in mind, before I came in, the previous clerk, uh, the uh, Board of Supervisors hired her up, hired him up, to, I mean, her up to work for him without a problem. So I had to go before the board nine times. Hmm. After the ninth time, finally, I had several individuals in the stand up say, uh, well, yeah, Mr. Stasty is correct. Uh, we, we need to go ahead and, and do this. And the board still voted, uh, I think it was one of four, to uh, not allow me to hire up uh, that clerk from the county perspective. So I had to end up hiring her up from my fee account which is common for some clerks uh, to do that. But keep in mind, I was just getting in, so I didn't have a chance to build up a fee account. Mm -hmm. So anyway, with the help of the good Lord, we was able to overcome that. Mm -hmm. And uh, shortly after that, uh, 
I was in here working one day, and I'm not gonna call the judge's name, but uh, a judge came down, cursing in my office, picking up my mini books, slamming them on the on the counter. Hmm. My staff is in here, and uh, my new staff is in here, and we were just like trying to say, "What's going on? What's going on?" He was like, "Well, I'm tired of this S H I T, and uh, you doing this uh, all wrong, and all this. You got the mini book out; it shouldn't be in, uh, on the counter, and just any little thing nitpick." So, basically, the same attorney uh, and lawyer and judge stood up. I took him to my office. I said. Can you just calm me down? Just tell me what's going on now. He said, well, he stood over my desk and looked me right in the eye and said, uh, just give up. Give it up. Give it up right now. I looked at him. I said, not today and not ever. Where I, mm -hmm. I pointed my finger in his face. Mm -hmm. wow. He said, if we wasn't, if we was not in this building, and we was outside this building, you would not be talking to me like this. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm not gonna fall for it. I'm not gonna fall for that mm -hmm. trap. That was a trap. I won't go fall for it. Yeah. So uh eventually um I had to get a bill signed. So I went up to his office the next day after I had my staff, I had my whole staff to write a letter to the judicial performance commission where where lawyers out of a judge is out of place. That's who you write your complaint to. And we sent a certified letter on behalf of me, the second clerk, to them. They end up calling him and telling him if he ever stepped foot in my office again with that type of behavior, they would have sanctions against him. So I went to him the next day and I heard record for a second time. Um, and the next day I asked him to sign my bill. And he said to me, you got the audacity to come up here and ask me to sign a bill when you wrote the Judicial Performance Commission on you? And I told him, I said, as a man, you respected me, you respected me, you disres disrespected me, you disrespected my office, and uh, you brought this to yourself. So at that point, he said, well, we need to just shake hands and grow old together in the office, things of that nature. So I'm saying that to say this, just because we get in office as first here in the Delta or nationwide, don't mean that the people that helped you get, get there should take their hands off you. They should stay committed to you a particular that first year because when you still got to deal with the same people that they had problems with you know and now you got to deal with it in a professional manner it takes a toll on you so uh and oftentimes i will tell some of the seasoned uh leaders in our community that look when we get new people in the office y'all stay out of these individuals and make sure that they have the confidence from you that they'll need to stay uplifted here while you're in that office right right <laughs> Well, that, that is truly, you know, commending you on all levels because it is very important to have, you know, the support, just how you said, having the support of your people, having the support of you. And it seems like you're very eager, you know, so LaFleur County is definitely, you know, blessed to have you in office because it seems like you're definitely making some change. And on top of that, you played a huge role in the discovery of the warrant, which we'll get into in a moment. But, you know, we definitely want to commend you for what you have done so far. And we'll get into more detail. But at this moment, we definitely would like to take time. We're going to pause for a few moments as we take a commercial break. To the listeners and the subscribers, thank you for staying tuned. This is the Juice for Life podcast sequel, The Vantage Point, and we will be back in a few moments. Royal Breakthrough Hair and Beauty. 
is presenting our natural hair care line, which will provide your hair with all the nutrients needed for stronger and healthier hair. With natural ingredients such as avocado oil, jojoba oil, nettle oil, and many more included in our products, your hair is sure to flourish and grow to its full potential. Purchase your Royal Breakthrough Hair Care products today at www.royalbreakthrough.com and enjoy the full Royal Breakthrough experience. The Mississippi Workers Center has successfully represented workers who have been victims of race and gender discrimination. The Terra on the Plant Floor campaign is an initiative that provides advocacy and organizing support for victims of racially and sexually hostile work environments. The campaign offers legal support and provides a space for workers to develop strategies to confront violating employers and heighten public awareness. If you are a Mississippi resident and feel you have been a victim of discrimination in your current work environment or would like to help and support this campaign, please visit www.msworkrights.org and join the fight with the Mississippi Workers Center for Human Rights. What has happened to the Nubian melaninite male? My brother, what are you doing? Look at you standing over there. How have you forgotten who you are? Come on, man. We're better than this. Killing each other, selling drugs in our neighborhood, listening to crazy music, allowing women, our women, our mothers, our daughters, our sisters, our wives to go unprotected. When do we stand? Who will stand with me? Will we fix the world in which we find ourselves today? Can it be done? I say yes. What say you? Join the Holy Cryptic Church of the Black Messiah. Journey Home Group International. Male and an endangered species? Order your book today at www.journeyhomegroup.com. Hey, welcome back from commercial break. Um, we want to thank you all again for joining us. We kind of just wanted to start off just to know more about you guys and what you guys have going on so that we can support you from our locations and not just in you know the region in which you reside. So we wanted to do that. And now we want to kind of move more into the Emmett Till case, um, because this is definitely something that is currently awaiting our attention. Um, it's Sister Kiana, do you want to go ahead and kick it off? Oh, definitely, definitely. So before our commercial break, um, you know, we did shed light on the fact that Elmas, you are the huge reason, you played a huge role in the assistance of discovering this warrant for Carolyn Bryant. You know, without you, that would not have happened. So, you know, this is, this is going to get amazing. So can you explain to us how exactly did that search begin? And since then, have you gotten any backlash from the court officials? Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. I can tell you that uh, this thing didn't start the day that the, the warrant was located. Um, we talked, myself, Tony Hill, and Keith Bochamp talked several months ago. And one of the questions that Attorney Hill had for me was the fact that they know that there may be a warrant out here. There is a warrant out there. But they had no idea where that warrant was located at. So uh, after talking with Attorney Hill and Keith, um, I basically began to think, and you know, they had several questions for me, and I was able to ask those questions. But ultimately, we came up with a conclusion saying that it may be here in the Florida County, and it may be located at the courthouse. So after talking to both Attorney Hill, which I've been knowing for years, uh, with her work with civil rights throughout the community, and Oftentimes, while I was working for Congressman Thompson, 
as a fear rep, I would reach out to her when we have individuals having problems in the community dealing with housing and other events. Mm -hmm. uh, we had through networking, I developed a relationship with Attorney Hill. If Attorney Hill was not involved with this, uh, I don't think this one would ever have been found, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. Uh, through her uh, inspiration and her perseverance, it allowed me the opportunity to say, okay, this is something that I need to be part of. Now, I can remember when, and I can take you back to this, but I remember when I was working for Thompson, and then to Barack Obama was running for office, and we was in a staff meeting, and Congressman Thompson came up and said to us in the meeting uh, that everybody's asking him who he's going to support, whether it be Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama. And Congressman Trump said it very loud and clear that I want to remain on the right side of history. I do not want to be on the wrong side of history. That's how I felt when Attorney Hill came to me. I wanted to be on the right side of history. So having said that, uh, we, we talked on the phone and eventually we agreed that uh, Keith would come up and look in the old jail. The old jail is located here at the courthouse on the third floor. Okay. Uh, we got old documents up there, old boxes and old paperwork and things of that nature. So he went up there first. And he stayed up basically a half a day uh, looking through boxes and things of that nature. And he came back to me and said, Elms, I cannot find what I'm looking for. So another young lady came up with him that day. Uh, I think her name was Melissa, if I'm not mistaken, I turned the hill. Yes. And uh, she also was with him up in the old jail and we're not successful. So then we came down, he came down to my office, which is located on the second floor. Well, the first floor, exactly. And uh, he said that he wanted to uh, ask me some other questions. So I began after this question. And what I did, I sort of slowed Keith down a little bit. Because I think myself and attorney here had already discussed uh, where the warrant may be located here in the office. So what I did, I said, well, if there's a warrant out there, a signed warrant, more than likely that warrant was signed by a judge, whether it's circuit judge or county judge. And if that warrant was signed by a judge, there's a order associated with that particular warrant. And if there's an order associated with the warrant, then there's a case file created. If there's a case file created, more than likely, it's located in my basement. Hmm. So uh, they asked me, when I went through that with Keith, he asked me, uh, well, is it okay for me to search your basement? And I said, yes, it's okay. You can go back without hesitation. Mm -hmm. I felt like before it was even located that we was onto something. Mm -hmm. In the minute book, and I looked in the minute book, and I found where they had, uh, they did have impounded a grand jury, and the case was presented to a grand jury. Mm -hmm. So I knew for a fact after that that more than likely we got something in the basement. So to make a long story short, um, Keith went down along with the young lady that was with him, Melissa, and uh, they searched the basement and was not successful. So he came back upstairs and said, well, Mr. Starsteel, this job is too big for me, me alone, along with this young lady. Can I bring back my team? And probably about a month, month and a half later, I think, Attorney Hill, uh, probably about a month and a half later, uh, he called me back. Said, well, my team is here. Attorney Hill sent me several emails and several text messages. <laughs> and she said, well, Elmas, uh, they want to come again. If it's okay with you, mm -hmm. uh, go and take a look in the basement. I said, Attorney Hill, for you, I couldn't say nothing but yes. <laughs> so, so we end up, uh, I allowed them to come in. I introduced myself to the team. Um, 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 the uh, Mrs. It was Keith Bochamp. Uh, what's the young lady from Minnesota? Terry Watts and Deborah Watts. Terry Watts and Deborah Watts, her mm -hmm. husband, uh, Terry's husband, 
Yes. And uh, Melissa, the other right. female that was with them. So that made up the team. Mm. And they went down in the basement. Uh, that day was a special day because when Keith and the team came down, I called Sim to David Jordan. And like I said, Senator Jordan has been a, uh, a role model for me, an inspiration for me. And I knew this kind of excitement behind the fact that it's a possibility that the ones can be here. I called mm -hmm. Senator Jordan in. And he came down and took pictures with the team, talked mm -hmm. to them about the projects that we got going here in LaFleur County regarding uh, the M&T monument that's coming to LaFleur County within the next couple of months. Uh, so I, I showed them a picture of that. Yes. and gave everybody a picture yeah. and uh of course at the same time when senator joy came upstairs uh he said i asked him about his sister who was very ill and he said that uh well miss Stastia, she's not doing well Sorry, your speaker is lost. I found out the next day or two that his sister had passed that particular day mm -hmm. so that's why i say it was mm -hmm. a special day for all of us and mm -hmm. shortly after he left that's when uh Keith called me down and said, Miss Stasha, I think we found the file. Okay. And I was like, wow, are you serious? Wow. Said, yes, I'm serious. So he gave me the file and mm -hmm. I, he showed me where they found it and everything. So I immediately looked around and uh, it was a red file. Similar, this is the Astra file right here. Mm. Red file that was gone. Okay. The one and everything is inside this file here that's the okay. original one right there mm -hmm. so at any rate um i had to make sure that it was authentic and once i looked at it it was uh, i looked at the paper and you got to think about paper that was developed in 1955 it got a certain fate it was faded beige but it was still kind of thick you know so anyway i took it upstairs looked at it very thoroughly i tested that uh document and the documents that were in the file as true copies from the original file and put my circuit seal on it and me to gave each copy to the family and mm -hmm. to keith that's what you see out there when you see the paperwork they have attested by the circuit clerk elmer stock still and from there they asked me so well, keep it down you know please don't say anything so and i didn't i didn't say anything to anybody to the next day <laughs> but because I knew sooner or later this thing gonna blow up, and I need to make sure the right people knew about it. So I right. need to call the DA mm -hmm. to inform him. I informed the sheriff, and uh, just uh, FYI, you know this thing gonna come up that the the warrant and other affidavit, other documents was found in the basement of my office. And so you probably hear about this in the near future. And yes, yeah. that is amazing. Um, that is absolutely amazing. I was wondering if I can load you up with three questions, if you don't mind, Attorney Hill, Jury Boo. Um, because I know you're we're running short on time, so I want to try to fit it all in. We have some questions that our audience really, really wants the answers to. But um, speaking of the warrant, did you um were you optimistic about finding it? What were what was your reaction afterwards? What's the energy like in Mississippi? And you know, do you have people now that the warrant is found that's telling you just leave it alone? You know, just give it up. Are you actually looking forward to um, a conviction now that this is found? Now that we actually have this surface. First, first of all, I I just. Uh, I'm just blown away hearing the whole story. There are pieces of it here and there. And just hearing Elmas talk about it the way he just mm -hmm. talked about it is just really, it's so inspiring to hear this type of courage because he could have told me no. He mm -hmm. could have said, no, you got to get a court order, Attorney Hill. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what most authorities tell me when I try to go into a workplace to investigate. No, you mm -hmm. can't come in here without a court, mm -hmm. court order. But, but this young man took courage. He welcomed the community into a public place where their tax dollars, not necessarily their tax dollars, but the tax dollars of the public pay for that space. He understood his level of accountability to the whole process. And that is how we were able to. Now, he says, if it weren't for me, it might not happen. I say it absolutely wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for Elmas Stockstill. And 
when I found out, I was traveling. I was in my car, and Keith called me. Deborah called. She said, "Are you sitting down?" I said, "Well, I'm driving." And she says, "You found it." I said, "You found it." I said, "What are you talking about? The warrant?" And she said, "Yes." I said, "But you've only been down there. You've been down there less than two hours, and I was coming tomorrow. Have you found it already?" Like, you found the warrant and the affidavit of arrest and the minutes page. I said, oh no, no, you couldn't, no, you didn't find all of it. They mm -hmm. found every document that we needed, every mm -hmm. document that was relevant to this woman wow. was found in less than two hours on June 21st, Cheney Goodman and Schwerner day, the day those three boys were murdered in 64. Mm -hmm. June 21st is when it found it. So it was all hanging together. The fact that David Jordan was in the office that day, his history, his whole, just his trajectory as a civil rights and human rights advocate, the fact that Elmas is so strong and knows who to pick for his mentors yes. so that he could stand up, right? So that he could have the courage that so many people don't have. So yeah, there was a yes. lot of excitement. Everybody was like, wow, wow, wow. A couple of detractors, yes. naysayers that I deal with just in terms of the law said to me, yeah, but you know, the warrant, you know, and so old and, you know, she's ill and they started throwing little stuff in the way. I said, look, it doesn't matter how old she is. It doesn't matter that the warrant is old. It is not expired. It is an outstanding warrant that had not been served. Right. It doesn't matter how old she is because Emmett is 14 and he's dust and bones now. And exactly. to see her child with justice. So, pardon me if it matter if it doesn't matter how old she is. Oh no, it doesn't yeah. matter. It is. So yeah, there are people saying, "Oh, we don't think anything can be done." There are folks at very various levels of government who say, "Oh, you know, the statute of limitations has run the this the that." But we have combed through the statutes. We have done the legislative history, and we found the appropriate exceptions that allow us to really address the issue of the viability of and validity of this warrant. Of this warrant. Okay. And because of Elmas, we were able to put that warrant out there, certified by the state department. So mm. on some levels, you have this courage that you might not be familiar with, right? And you asked me how I felt and what I've been dealing with in my practice as an activist all these years, even before I became a lawyer, I've been dealing mostly with rank, cowardice behavior. Mm. In an office, they look like me, but they don't have the courage to do what is right. Mm. We're looking at right now. Yes. We, who's accountable? Where are the points of authority? Where are the points of accountability? And I have said this over and over again. He's not here. He's not sitting on the screen with us. But I have said over and over again, we have one elected official in Congress, even though there are other congressmen in this area, we have one, Congressman mm -hmm. Thompson, second mm -hmm. district, is the congressperson for all of us, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. our issues never come to the fore unless we can. And I met Elmas through Congressman Thompson. I met mm -hmm. Elmas because mm -hmm. I was on staff with Congressman Thompson as his chief in this in LaFleur County. And ever since I've known him, he's been a stand-up brother. When he was when he worked with Congressman yeah. Thompson, he did amazing work in the community. And now, as a circuit clerk, he is a stand-up brother. I can't say enough. I got to think about some awards that he needs to get. I got <laughs> I got to do whatever I can because this brother is the real deal. And yeah. you know, about how something might not be important to others, right? You know. Mm -hmm in your current life, what, a warrant? Okay, so a warrant, you know. But you think about what it's attached to and what it means in this case. Right. It means that, first of all, all along, we've known that Carolyn Bryant was central to not just the kidnapping, but the ultimate murder. Right. You can't separate the kidnapping from the murder. Thank you, now. Yes, I think it is skipping. All right. 
there are incidents in history where, like Alma said, you choose to stand on the side of history, on the right side of history, or you choose to stand on the wrong side of history. Well, I'm going to say that Elmas, because of you, because you chose to stand on the right side of history, you didn't give us the patent answer that we've been hearing. You didn't tell us nothing could be done. You didn't. You didn't say, "Oh well, you know, I'm not available." Mm -hmm. um. So it looks like, yes, I know she's mentioned that she is traveling, so she's in a hotel. Maybe their internet is not as stable. Um, right. But you know, while we're waiting on her to come back in, can you briefly tell us? I want us to try to fit in as much as we can. Can yes. you um, briefly tell us what would a successful conviction look like? What What would that look like? How many years? What exactly are we looking forward to? Well, it's hard for me to answer that because of my role as circuit clerk. That would be more of a uh, doc, attorney heel question mm -hmm. uh, because even in my data job, you know, we process the paperwork, we process the uh, the, the, the indictments, we process the capias. Uh, we do all the paperwork pertaining to this, but usually the DA office and others will be the ones that will, will be the ones that the prosecute the side. Okay. So um, um, maybe ask yeah. you then, um, Attorney Hill, you went out for a minute. So yeah, uh, we were just happened. trying to ask what now with, with us having this warrant, what would a successful conviction look like? How many years? What are we looking forward to realistically now that this has surfaced? Well, you asked a multi layered question. <laughs> uh, even in the 21st century, kidnapping is still a felony. Uh, murder is still a felony, and there's no statute of limitations on murder. There is a statute of limitations on kidnapping, but we believe that the exception that's provided in the statute protects us from that defense. Uh, of course, the first thing would be for the district attorney to alert the authorities, that is the sheriff's department of Floor County, there is a warrant that needs to be served. He would agree that he would be bringing charges against Carolyn Bryant, which should have been done in 1955. He would agree, we hope, that he would agree to impanel a grand jury to explore her culpability only, right? We're not mm -hmm. talking about a grand jury to explore the culpability of two dead men. We're talking about the one person who was never prosecuted being put to the test not necessarily physically, because it might just be the evidence. She may never appear. But putting on proof that there is culpability, deciding that there is that proof would be the grand jury, and whether they would turn a true bill or a no true bill. We're hoping, of course, for a true bill where she would be indicted for kidnapping, right? Because that's what the warrant is asked to. But we okay. also hope that there will be a broader investigation into the connection between the kidnapping and the actual murder, and that she could be charged with both kidnapping and murder, because the mm. kidnapping led to the murder. The murder. Brad right. was the one could kill her. So mm. she was a part of that. She was a part of it. She, was, she participated in the frenzy that was whipped up. She told whatever she said to her husband and her brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. That led to the death of Emmett Lewis. And if right. you look at the way he died, there's lynchings and then there are lynchings. Okay? Mm -hmm. You look at all the bodies, you look at all the necks in rope, mm -hmm. and you look at Emmett Till's body. Mm -hmm. What the condition of that body tells us is that was hatred beyond hatred. Mm -hmm. That was a crime of passion, a crime where they believed in their warped minds they needed to protect the femininity and the honor of the white woman. Mm -hmm. Nobody protected the femininity and honor of Mamie Chico, mm -hmm. lost her only child. Mm -hmm. So we're convinced that the wheels of justice for us started turning when folks were allowed to do the investigation. And that started mm -hmm. with Brother Stocksville. And I, I, lift, I lift that up because courage is in short supply. 
accountability is even in less short supply. Many people get elected, they ride on the fact that they look like us and they're not us and they don't do right by us. Mm -hmm. Democrats who side with Republicans who are running against candidates that would be the candidates that we want. Mm -hmm. And some of them look like us and betray us. Mm -hmm. Right. You see people standing up, we have to lift them up. We have to support them. No matter what comes down, we got to make sure we protect those who are brave. We protect those who are acting within their official capacity. Nothing mm -hmm. that Thomas described is outside of his official clerk capacity that he was elected to carry out. The difference is that he did that, and many others have shied away from their duties and not done that. And that's what we're dealing with right now. Right. Attorney, mm -hmm. that's what we're dealing with. And so, and I want everyone to understand too that, of course, this is Jeribu talking. I'm not trying to get anyone to sign on to these beliefs that I have about the lack of accountability at the district attorney level. But in my experience, I have seen elected officials literally abdicate their responsibilities. And it goes back to what Bob Marley said, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. And that's true today. We have to look at in the mirror and see if we're contributing to the oppression of our people, or are we contributing to the upliftment? And I say Elmas serves with distinction, and he is definitely contributing to the upliftment of our people. And you learn well from your, your biggest mentor, Congressman Denny Thompson, Elmas. I know he is very proud of you. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And so are we. Yes, ma'am. Definitely. Yes, definitely. We all are proud of you both. You know, you both. And we're definitely hoping for the best outcome justice to be served for the murder, the torture, the kidnapping of Emmett Till. So we definitely appreciate you both for taking the time out today, coming on to speak with us. We wish we could go on longer, but we know, you know, how you have other things that, you know, are important as well. So like we said, we appreciate you both for taking the time today to come on to the Jews for Life podcast sequel, The Vantage Point. You know, with our platform, we intend to assist in all the ways we can to uplift, share awareness, empower with the truth, and most importantly, fight for our people, especially against the very system of white supremacy that has injected itself in our Nubian homes by way of economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, yes. politics, religion, sex, war, the list goes on. So when it comes to injustice against our people, no matter how big, small, or long before us, it was, we, the righteous Jews, are going to join that fight by utilizing our voice and our platform. So family, share this live, show love, donate to the Edda Beda Recreational um, Nonprofit Organization, visit Jeribu Hill's website to assist yeah. in helping with the labor issues going on in Mississippi. Knowledge is power and strength is in numbers. And together we can all make a change. So with that being said. <laughs> oh, you're the bomb, you're the bomb. Yes. yes. Thank so you we wish that on. we had more time and we hope that, you know, maybe another time, you know, we can have you back and just We'd really. We're going to take it on the road, right, Elmas? That's it. That's it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you so much. Love you guys. Appreciate yes. you. So no problem. Yes, same, same. Bye -bye. It's bye bye. All right. Have a nice one. Bye -bye. You too. <laughs>